I struggle with where to start stories. I heard Dan Carlin say on his last episode of Hardcore History that he's addicted to context. He has stories he wants to tell, and once he gets into them, the story changes so much that his original idea for one show on one topic turns into a six-part series on something else entirely. That's how I feel about what I wanted to share with you right now. I wrote and rewrote a script several times, and the more I added to it, the more it just got further and further away from me to the point where I didn't understand what I was even trying to communicate. So I'm just going to go back to basics here. I'm going to simplify this for myself and for you. Because honestly, you would have heard me rant for 45 minutes and go on tangent after tangent and try to tie a bunch of disparate points into one coherent message, but that wasn't working for me, which means there's no way it would have worked for you. Instead, I'm just going to strip all that away, including commentary on a Reddit thread that initially inspired me to record this, which you can click on in the show notes, by the way, if you're interested. It's quite the trip. But I'm going to strip all that away and just be real. In episode 29, I spoke with Dan Willis. The first hour of that conversation, Dan talked at length about some of the hidden history of supposed extraterrestrial contact with humanity in the process of disclosing that to the general public. But when I contacted Dan about coming on the show, I didn't mention this topic at all. I was much more interested in his work with Dr. Marcel Vogel on quartz crystals and the sacred geometry of water and how to structure it. Obviously, Dan's background beyond that is compelling, and if you heard that episode, you know why. He's an ex-Navy guy whose professional travels have taken him many different places, including to Washington, D.C., where he testified in front of the National Press Club about what's commonly referred to as ETI, or extraterrestrial intelligence. He talked about that supposed human contact with ETI and deals cut between governments and technology embargoes and so on. But honestly, I wasn't expecting to talk about that in such great detail. I hadn't prepared to talk about it that much. As I said, I was more interested in the other topics that we talked about in the second hour. Frankly, the disclosure topic doesn't interest me much. My issue with disclosure is the large group of people pushing for it. Pushing for this quote-unquote truth to finally come out. But that group that's pushing for this truth is pushing for it from a gang of corrupt authority figures. The people fighting for disclosure are fighting against an entity that has done nothing but hide, cloak, lie, and kill to keep secrets. The more I think about disclosure, the more I think it's just a matter of telling people what they want to hear, not necessarily what's actually going on. It seems more like this entity has spent all this time building up this fervor, creating another false reality beyond the veil so that when the time came to lift the veil, so to speak, when people started clamoring for some appeasement beyond the superficial bullshit we've all come to hate, it seems like when that time came that they'd have an answer for us. It just seems like another distraction, just another false construct being built for you instead of being built by you. That's the heart of the issue for me. It's more hive mind groupthink. It's more humans externalizing their search for truth instead of internalizing it. The further out you go to search for truth, the further away from it you actually are. That's why I got rid of everything I had initially written and rewritten. I had 15 pages of me tumbling down a rabbit hole that started with disclosure, then somehow got onto coronal mass ejections and reptilians and the whole Corey Good stuff, and then I just got lost in it. The whole thing made no fucking sense. It was me trying to externalize. I was trying to turn chaos into order, and that never works. Those of you familiar with the occult know that answers are rarely found outside. They're rarely given to you by others. You seek within, and you find within. The universe, the universe, your one verse, is a reflection of you, of your truth within, whatever it may be. We need to stop assuming the external and the others that populate it are going to give us any sort of truth. Because others are only giving you their truth. The trick is to not let someone else's truth become yours. Because then they can wield power over you. That's the trap we've fallen into again and again as individuals and as a species. I heard Walter Bosley say recently that paranormal phenomena knows your motives. It knows what you want to see. He said, quote, if you want to go out and have the close encounters of the third kind or the ET experience, you can go out and it will give you that. Of course, that might not be what's really going on. End quote. What is the it he's talking about? Is it this etheric energy that can literally manifest anything we desire? I don't know. And I don't want to pretend like I do know. Because who does know what's really going on? No one does. 
We're all trying to explain something that's unexplainable through our own distorted lenses, which again is our fatal flaw as individuals and as a species. Each of us is trying to make order out of chaos. Instead of embracing the random, we settle for tidy, convenient, comfortable little reality bubbles that make too much sense. You ever met someone who's too nice and it actually bothers the shit out of you? That's what this is. It's too nice. It's too comfortable. Honestly, the universe, our individual universe, our one verse, it's completely random. There is no single explanation, interpretation, or understanding of it that is correct or accurate. It's chaotic and therefore cannot be made sense of. Anyone that says something is one specific way is a charlatan. Physicist or priest, parishioner or podcast host, I don't care. Charlatans, all of them. There's no such thing as objectivity. There is only subjectivity. The observer effect, no one can avoid it. As a group, we have forgotten this because we have lost touch with our subjectivity, with our individuality. We have herd mentalities, that group think, those hive minds I mentioned earlier. We have allowed ourselves, our space selves, capital S, to be swindled. Our psyches have been manipulated, our senses raped, our spirits pillaged. We have allowed the chaotic nature of our space self. We have allowed that real chaos inside of us to be siphoned off and used against us to construct this fake order. You remember the quote, right? Order from chaos or out of chaos comes order. It's exactly what we've allowed to happen. We allowed our individuality to be stripped away from us. Our individual sovereignty dissipated because it was easier on our mortal vessels. The chaos we all have inside of us was plundered and replaced by order. A new world order constructed for you, not by you. And they, whoever they are, built that order because order is easier to control. Order is easier to explain, to interpret, to understand. Order is what ego feeds on. It's what ego craves. Order is governed by the almighty dollar. Order is your shitty 9-to-5 job. All the bills you have to pay. All the rules and regulations and restrictions and laws you're forced to live under. All the incessant celebrity gossip and rigged sporting events and mass media theatrics you're subjected to. Order is genetically modified bread and geopolitical circuses. But that order does seem to be breaking down. Finally! Finally, we're getting back to that chaos. We're reclaiming our sovereignty, our psyche, our senses, our spirit. Yes, finally, we are awakening, ascending. Our collective consciousness is rising. Or is it? See, this is where we have to be careful. This is where our discernment is going to be tested. We really have to let our hearts guide us here. Because maybe, just maybe, these ideas of collective consciousness and spiritual awakening and ascension, maybe this is the new order. Maybe this is the new world order that's being constructed for us instead of by us. Maybe the foundation for this order has been laid in the last several decades and now the rest of it is being built for everybody else brick by brick, hashtag by hashtag, woke hipster by woke hipster. And this leads me to a theory, to an idea known as hypernormalization. This was an idea first presented in a 2006 book by Alexei Yurchak titled Everything Was Forever Until It Was No More, The Last Soviet Generation. Here's a quick synopsis of the book from Wikipedia. Quote, the book is about the paradoxes of life in the Soviet Union during the 20 years before it collapsed. A professor of anthropology at the University of California, Berkeley, Yurchak argues that everyone knew the system in the Soviet Union was failing, but as no one could imagine any alternative to the status quo, politicians and citizens were resigned to maintaining a pretense of a functioning society. Over time, this delusion became a self-fulfilling prophecy, and the fakeness was accepted by everyone as real, an effect that Yurchak termed hypernormalization. End quote. As I said, this book was published in 2006, but I wasn't aware of it until about three months ago. I had stumbled across a documentary released late last year by the British Broadcasting Corporation called Hypernormalization. This was directed by a British filmmaker named Adam Curtis, who's a rather respected filmmaker. He's won four BAFTAs, which is the British equivalent to the Emmys, for what that's worth. I'll link to this doc on YouTube in the show notes. I'd encourage you all to watch it. It's pretty interesting, although it is about three hours long. The point of the film is simple. Since the 70s... Governments, financiers, and technological utopians have given up on the complex real world and built a simple fake world that is run by corporations and kept stable by politicians. Now, I discern this as an idea likely to be true. I say likely to be true because I'm reminded now of the theory that Robert Anton Wilson put forth that states the only thing that exists is probability. So in this case, I find the probability of hypernormalization being true to be higher 
than the probability of it being false. I could also get really meta here and say I find the probability of Wilson's theory of probability being true to be higher than the probability of it being false, but I think it's getting a little confusing. I digress. This does beg some important questions, though. If hypernormalization is probable, what exactly is the fake world that it alludes to, and what exactly is the real world? Where does the fake end and the real begin? The fake world seems rather easy to parse through. It's the one we've all been actively participating in. The one right here, right now. The one built on materialism and governed by the almighty dollar. It's the genetically modified bread and geopolitical circuses. But what if this fake world also extends to what we consider to be real? And by we, I mean people into the fringe, into the occult and the paranormal, conspiracy theories, spirituality, mythology, alternate cosmologies, etc. And what if this paranormal portion of the fake world has also been constructed for us and we're getting ready to walk right into it? As Bosley said, paranormal phenomena knows your motives and knows what you want to see, and the people who know about this phenomena and the powers that be know about this, believe me, they're doing all they can to influence you into wanting certain things, things that appear to be what we want, but things that ultimately keep that order in place. Hey, if more and more people want corrupt leaders exposed, or extraterrestrial disclosure, or the restoration of magic, well, guess what we're going to get? If you want to live in a world with 120 different alien species, hey, here you go. Here's your Draco reptilians and your greys and your blue avians. Ladies and gentlemen, the deep state may have actually constructed an even deeper state for us to get lost in. We're going to get that flavor of bread. And we're going to get those types of circuses. I guess all I'm saying is be careful. Be careful with whom you've been cohabitating with or co-creating with. You may feel as if your juju is on point, but unless you've mastered your space, capital S, self, and don't need a co-creator, you're still very much under the influence of their order. Yes, this is a, a pivotal moment in our collective existence, but we have to remember that this is an individual journey. You know, one of my favorite movies is The Wizard of Oz, and 78 years after its release, it's as relevant now as it's ever been. We all want the man behind the curtain to reveal himself to us. But if The Wizard of Oz taught us anything, it's that the answers we seek are already here. Remember that line when Dorothy and the gang stroll in to meet the wizard and the curtain gets pulled back? Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. You know why? Because he's a charlatan, an illusion, a reflection of your own creative capabilities. Seriously, pay him no mind. Your character is already courageous. Your mind is already sharp. Your heart is already pure. But it's time to reclaim your spirit. It's time to reclaim your chaos.